Welcome, Bishop. But wow. I just want, I forgot one thing. We yes. will not have a, but one service on Sunday. One service on Sunday, 10 a.m. So don't come at 8.30, 10 o'clock, Sunday morning. Mother's Day. Good morning. Good, um, good morning, Mother's Day. Oh, good evening, everybody. Woo. One of these got to go. Well, maybe that's okay. Is that what it is? All right. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for being here. It's time for Bible study. Father, we thank you for a wonderful privilege opportunity to hear from heaven, to preach the uncompromised word of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for a time to open the scriptures that we might, and we ask you to open our hearts and our minds that we would comp be able to comprehend the scriptures. We thank you that you, we have perception, that you've given us all things that pertain to godliness through the knowledge that we have about Jesus Christ and you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. We declare that we have received them and we change our confession accordingly. The kingdom has come into our lives. Your will is being done in our lives on earth as it already has been done in heaven. We ask you for a special word of wisdom to apply all the things that you have done and given us. And we'll take them, these things and use them and put them to work in our lives just to see how you will work in our lives through how we use these things that you have given us and blessed us with. And Father, we ask that it'll be as if we have heard from you directly from heaven tonight and that you will speak to us clearly and that we'll know that it is you talking to us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to encourage others because they will find you if they believe we have what they think that they need. For this we thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen. amen. Say amen again. We're going to pick up where we left off Sunday. If you don't have one of these uh, sheets, please get one. We will need it. Uh, well, you will, I'll use it from time to time. But tonight I'm going to get right into where we left off the last time together. Now, the, we, I was, we left us talking about three motivations for being righteous. Now, righteous is a very important word because the Hebrew is zadik, and then the Greek is dikaios, but it means to be filled with, be full, to uh, abound, and to resemble the nature of what is just right, real good, and the proper thing to do. We won't look at the outline to that tonight, but please keep that for you, and we'll uh, get to it from time to time. I believe there are three ways. The Bible says, if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20 and 21, a very familiar passage that we've always used, always quoted, and it, now then we we're ambassadors for Christ, and as though God were pleading uh, through us, we implore you to be reconciled to God. You have to be reconciled. Reconciled is a bookkeeping term. It's an accounting term. Basically, it means you take the books from the bank or your bank statement. You take your record that you have. You compare the two. And where they disagree, you find out where the problem is. So once you find out where the problem is, you find out how to resolve the problem, and then you reconcile your books you have to reconcile your checkbook once a month unless you just have lots of money and you can spend it and it doesn't matter what, you, what happens but I remember the day when I needed every penny. Do you all, can you all remember any of those days when you work all week or all every two weeks and you wait for that check or once a month you wait for that check and I was a teacher you only get paid once a month and you got to reconcile, you, you, know about, you know what you're going to receive if you're a government employee because it's the same thing every month unless you're going to do some overtime. And so we would sit down and we will write out our bills, write out our checks, 
and put them in envelopes because at that time you didn't have any computers and uh, you put them in envelopes and you take those envelopes, put stamps on them and be ready to mail them on the day that your check, that you deposit your check in the bank. Now, you want, you look at your check register because you want to make sure whatever is in the bank at that time, you want to make sure you don't overwrite your checking account. But unless you are willing to reconcile what the bank says in the, uh, what they call the, the department of the, uh, the proofing department, they check to see if indeed uh, what the bank says with what you have in your check register, you got to find the problem. If you are unwilling to reconcile yourself to God and live like you want to, and don't, well, God says what he says over here, and I'm going to say it like this. We understand that God has said something because this is God's book. It is a book about God. As a matter of fact, one of the things that is very surprising to me, the longer I live, the longer I study, the more I preach, I have found that the Bible is, you might say, a book of metaphors, a book of examples, illustrations, a book of alliterations and narratives and poetry and songs. And though you, when you read it, you think you're reading about something that is a physical application and you just read it and you think you're just naturally reading like you're reading any other book and every narrative there is another story going on there's a there's a story between the lines there's a story behind the story for example in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth and God said let us make man well, God is the spirit. Well, that's not a metaphor, but it says God made man. Well, Jesus said no one has seen the Father God at any time. The only begotten who's in the bosom of the Father has told you about him. He said you have neither seen his form nor heard his voice nor seen his form. And those two um, statements that he makes is in John chapter 1 and verse 18. And in, Matt, in John chapter 5, and verse 37, you have neither heard his voice and you ain't never seen his form. But in the beginning, God created us in his image and his likeness, according to Genesis 1, 26 and 27. So now, if God is a spirit and he's made us in his image and according to his likeness, then what is it about us? What part about us makes us like him? And Je Jesus said, God is spirit. And they that worship God must worship him spiritually. So when you start reading the Bible, it's going to be a spiritual revelation. The Bible rarely says what it means. It tells you a story in hopes that you got enough insight, patience, wisdom, and experience to figure out what it's talking about. And he talks about casting your pearls before swine. The Bible talks about being faithful in that which is another person's. Eventually you will get that which is your own. The Bible talks about if you don't uh, use what you have, even that which you seem to have will be taken away from you. And these examples apply to other things in life. And they can apply anywhere, anywhere, and in every area of your life. And one of the ways that you can really, uh, you can find out how to use the Bible in a great way to, you, to help you is to find you a verse for something you want to do. And use that verse and, and play with that verse. And that verse will take on life and meaning and form and it'll take on a whole understanding that you'll use it. For example, Proverbs 28, 1. The Bible says, 
People who are twisted in their mind and in their thought life, they run from things when nobody is chasing them. But the righteous, those who are full, who have that, who do believe in doing that which is just right, and number two is what? Real good. And number three, the proper thing to do and say and be. And uh, real good is authentic, genuine, certified. And, uh, and the last one, it says not only that, but then it says certified, then it says a genuine and legitimate, actual and authentic, certified and factual, and it's the proper thing to do. You accept it. You'll adapt to it. You respect it. You, it's preferred by you, and it's decent and polite. And, but he says, the righteous. But you've got to be full of something. The righteous, notice what it says, are, and it leaves out the comparison, but it states it kind of in an unusual way. We would normally say, the righteous are, and then we would say, as bold as a lion. But the Bible says the righteous are bold. The righteous are bold. And it describes the righteous as bold. The righteous are not as bold as a no. The righteous are bold. <laughs> Listen to what I'm standing here again. Notice what it says. But instead of running from things, the wicked who are twisted in their thought life, when nobody is pursuing them, they run. But the righteous, if you're full of the knowledge of God, that he has already blessed you. Say he's already blessed me. While I, we were sitting there, Pastor Carrie, we made this confession, the offertory confession. Then she tapped me and say, and, and, and sometimes the, the word, they just come to life while you're saying something else. You're not thinking about it, but it just jumps off the page at you. In our confession, we say, now Father, now watch this, the righteous are what? Bold. Not the righteous are as bold, but the righteous are what? Just strictly straight out what? Bold. And not only are they bold, they bold, bodacious, and confident, but they're bold as a lion. So she mentioned this to me and she said, now Father, as you look down from your holy habitation from heaven to bless us as you said in your word, and then she tapped me in on it. She, she said, think about that. We believe we receive. We believe that we receive. Well, I'm going to move a little further down the road tonight. Are you ready? Just a little bit. You're going to move just a little further. And I'm coming back to where I am dealing with the righteous, a bold as a lion, and we're still, still dealing with the word. Now, the first one I'm going to turn to is Ephesians 1. Let's look at Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, 3. We'll divert for a moment, but it's, still, it's not a diversion, but it's still, we're going where we're headed. You know, sometimes you can get, start out on a trip, and as a detour, you're still going, you're going to get there, but you, you have to go that way. Look at, let's read Ephesians chapter three, 1, verse 3. Let's read. Blessed. That is, that blessed word means to be highly favored or venerated, and the Lord bless them. In other words, the Lord, uh, when he created us in his image and his likeness he to him he had profound respect a profound respect and appreciation when we could come to grips with the fact that we are created in his image and his image is spiritual because see flesh and blood cannot inherit this kind of understanding and that's why sometimes a brother biological brother is born for adversity but a friend spiritual friend will love you when at all times so profoundly respected and highly appreciated be the god and what father now notice not only is be the what the god who is god the creator of the heavens and the earth we can give you our 17 things that tell us about who god is if you're an athlete and you're strong arm you say he's the what 
everlasting arm. You can come on, help me out. He's the, he's the what? Everlasting arm. If you're in government and he's, in, you be, he's been elected to a position of power, they're the powers that be, we say he is even a what? A what? A higher power. We say if in terms of rocks and geology, we say, well, if he is uh, whoever God is, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the galaxy, the hemisphere, the stratosphere, the clouds, the water, the trees, we don't know who created, but everything is created by somebody. Everything you have has been created by somebody. So we don't know who created the universe, but everything here has been created by somebody. We don't know who it was. So then now we're looking for somebody who we cannot see. We can see what they made, but we want to see them. And so the writers of the scripture said, in the beginning, whoever he is, call him what you want to name him what you may. And they say, who? God did what? Created the heavens and the earth. So not only, so uh, to, to the geologist, he is the rock of all of the what? Ages. And if you're to old people, who gets real old and they say ancient. I heard someone say this week, they said, uh, they, said they asked me on, well, Mr. Layla, how old are you? I said, oh, I'm 74. They said, we can put you in this seat. I said, okay, well that worked. He said, well, from Puerto Rico, we don't use the word old. So I thought, and he told me, I said, what do you mean? He said, we don't use the word old. We, th we, we use a term from horticulture and fruit. We say, when you have an orange, or pear, when you look at the fruit, you don't say it's old, do you? If it's, if it's ready to eat, you say it's what? It's ripe. Or if you waited for the season to change it, it's now what? It says matured. So instead of saying you're old, you can say you're what? You're ripe. Or you are mature. And the opposite of being ripe and mature is what? green <laughs> yeah. and uh, a lot of these young folk and a lot of, have you seen some green some old people who green see again you would think that I'm talking about oranges did y'all get that did y'all get that shift just then you think I'm talking about oranges but I ain't talking about no oranges so when you read the scriptures it ain't talking about what you think it's talking about so <laughs> an older person or even and what makes it so good, a younger person can be what? Ripe. As well as mature. And one of the things that bring make, that ripens fruit, it has to hang on the tree long enough, is cool weather. A little cool weather will bring out sweetening in fruit. Sometimes you have to leave a little trial, a little cool, not too cold, but cool weather. And uh, it'll bring out, it make the fruit sweeter. So he said, no, Mr. Lately, you're not old. You are what? Ripe and mature. Turn to somebody and say, I'm ripe. Oh, well, you, you, it, it would be wonderful if Dylan, the little fella there, that if he, he is all, he's also what? Ripe and mature. You don't want to be green all your days. How long are you going to be green? And we use that. With, with, you know, they say people who are ignorant about things, who don't know about things, say, no, they're green. <laughs> they're just as green as I don't know what. In other words, they don't have sense enough to come in out of the rain. They don't understand anything. And, and I pray tonight that you will never refer to yourself as being green. And it is okay to refer to yourself as being mature and ripe. So the Bible says in Ephesians, blessed are highly profound, that blessed be who? God. Now, for you and for me, I don't know about you, but for me, it is so important to me. I have to focus on, and when I hear the word God, I need to get my mental picture. So I slow down just a little bit so I can get an image of every word up there comes with an image. Watch this. If I say dog, immediately you think of what? A four-legged animal, right? You think of one. If I say car, what? You think of, you think of a car. If I say bicycle, you, you know it. So language is visual. Listen to me now. Language is visual. If you talk too fast, 
you don't have a chance, or sing too fast, you don't, you don't, or, or say something so quickly, the person doesn't have a chance, the computer does not have a chance to what? Call up the picture associated with the what? Word. If I say, don't catch chicken and frog, you miss all of it. You hear where I'm coming from? You miss all of it. So he says, blessed be what? Then he says what? Not just God, but says what? The God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind and your strength, and you shall love your neighbor just as much as, but no more than you love yourself. And by all means, you need to love yourself. And a lot of people have taken loving others too far at the expense of themselves. And mamas are known for it. They really will love them children. Oh, that's my baby. I, I, have, I, got, I, have, I have some situations that I can, I, give you, I can give you all a whole lot of pictures. But I have not seen so many green grown folks in a long time. I mean, they green. They green when it comes to their children. The children, now listen to me, you cannot have, it's, it's, it's a contradiction to have a grown child. You can't be both. If you have a grown child, you got a problem. Think about it. It goes along with the same thing where Reverend Blaine at Bethel used to say this. Don't refer to your child as a kid. Every time throughout scripture, the only time you see the word kid, it always refers to an offspring of a goat. A kid is the offspring of a goat. And the goat's daddy name is Billy because that is the name given to the male goat. The female goat is known as what? The nanny. So, the Billy and Nanny is the mama and the daddy of the kid. And if you, what then is the characteristic of Billy and Nanny? And the, see, I, see, I ain't talking about no goats. See, you think I'm talking about goats. Notice, you think I'm talking about goats. I'm not talking about goats, but I am, but I'm not, but I am, but I'm not. But I am, but I'm not. I'm not, but I am. And so, when you use and you refer to your child as what? A kid. What you're saying is, I want you to produce for me. You are a kid. And I want you to produce for me the characteristics of a kid. And what then is the characteristics of a kid? What does a goat do? They always, they do this, they do what? They butt. And then when they get to the one hit, they go back up. And then they run again and they go. <laughs> I, I like to see things like that. And they know. For, and then a, the, another characteristic of a kid is they always eat. They walk up to you and start eating on your pants. They chew on your pants. They just chew on your clothes. They chew anything. They, they can clean a yard carefully. They eat everything. And <laughs> the notice the Bible says this. When the Lord establishes his kingdom, he said, at the millennial, he said he will separate the what? The sheep from the goats. You think he's talking about sheep and goats? The characteristics, the qualities, and the temperaments of people. So blessed be the God. That's the, so then I got this picture, God. For me, it connects me spiritually. Right then I go into the invisible because now faith is the substance of things, what? Hope for, the evidence of things not seen. And in the beginning, whoever he is, he created the heavens and the earth. So we, I want to empower God because he is profoundly impressed with me. He is impressed and he, is, he has venerated me. He has blessed me. It's the veneration. It's to have profound respect for somebody. I have profound respect for God, the creator of the heaven and the earth, who for us is the father. Wait a minute. He's the father of, for us who is our what? Lord. What is the Lord? Whoever lords over you, they have, or you have surrendered to them, supreme 
authority and power. So if you call somebody Lord, or somebody my Lord, or whatever it is, they have authority and power over you. Now, Paul says, whoever you submit yourself to, that's your Lord. So you want to be careful who you always, and John said, Jesus said this to the Pharisees. They said, uh, Jesus, by whose authority do you do all this stuff that you're doing? He said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll ask you a question. And if you answer my question, then I will answer your question. The moral of the story is just because somebody's bold enough to ask you a question don't mean you got to be bold, be uh, uh, submitted to enough to answer it. Just, if they don't have authority over you, you don't have to answer the question. I hope you understand where I'm coming from. And a lot of people try to bring you under that authority by asking you a question and expect you to answer it. And you, you don't owe them an answer. They can ask you anything. Some things ain't your business. I don't know where that came from, but it is. So he said, well, I'll answer your question if you answer mine. He knew they were testing him. He said, John's baptism, he came preaching in the wilderness. Was his baptism of men? Was he commissioned by men, some bishops and some deacons who commissioned John to go out and put, give him some license and say, go out and baptize folk? Or was, it, was his baptism that he was baptizing people to repent and be baptized in water as if, and to change their mind about how they saw their lives was, it, was as if it was from God. And they said to, among themselves, well, now, you know what? If we say, John, all that ministry that John had out there in the, in the, in the, in the, in the Jordan, baptizing, it wasn't nothing to it. It was a man-made thing, and uh, it was from men. He said, all these people around here who, who, who regard John as a prophet, they'll stone us to death because they really love John the Baptist. They say, but if then we say, oh, John's baptism was as if it was from God. Then he going to ask us, then why didn't you go out there and get baptized then? If you, if you tell me it was from God. And to keep from answering either question, they said what? We don't know. That's a liar right in the front of the face of the Lord. They say we don't know. Because they wanted to be uncommitted. Remember, there are three people. There is the atheist. The, the, one, the atheist said there is no God. The one, the agnostic in the middle says, well, we don't know for sure. And then the monotheist, we say there is a God. They didn't want to say there is a God. They didn't want to say and everything he did was a man because it's not of God. And so they came into the third, the, the middle category and say what? The agnostic say what? We just don't know. When you be careful, when you let that come out your mouth all the time, I don't know, 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 I don't know. That means I do not have at my disposal right now any knowledge on the subject. Blessed be God, the creator. Now, I don't know about you, the older I get, the, the more I like this thing. And he, in our minds, Paul said, is the father. And he's the father of who we have given authority over us. And who is that? Jesus, the man who proved to us he was what? Anointed through his signs and wonders and miracles, his virgin birth and his ascension. He is the Christ, the anointed one, special favor and grace. And when you have a special gift and anointing and calling and you can do things that other people cannot do, that's what you call Christ. It's called Creo. It means the anointed one. And when you anoint somebody, it's like you got something on you that somebody else doesn't have on them. When you're fighting off a cold sometimes, they get some Vicks uh, vapor rub. And if everybody else in the house is doing fine, but there's only one of y'all feeling tough. And so the mom and the daddy go and get, or you go and get some what? Some Vicks vapor rub. And you rub it on your chest. You rub it a little under your nose. Some people rub it under the bottom of their feet. Whoever, am I right? Who else is anointed in that house with that? Huh? Talk to me. You can talk. You're the only one with it, right? Think about this. Look at your life. And see how many people in your anointing, in your family, 
has an anointing similar to what you got on you. You have a special anointing on you. That some other in your family, it may they have a similar anointing, something like yours. It's nothing exactly not like yours. And so that's where he says he's the father. What does father mean? We say, well, father, it means the source. He is the origin. He's the fountain. He's the foundation. He's the beginning of it. He, God, the creator, is the father of who we call Lord. And, and through the example of Jesus' man, who is like us, a man like us, a person like us, anointed by God. Notice what it says. With this understanding, we want to, we have a profound respect for God because we see him as who? The father of the Lord who we give an authority over our lives through the example, like Jesus said, when he was baptized, came up out of the water, the spirit of God descended upon him like a dove and it's opened, the heavens said, uh, the heavens said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then somebody said, well, mm, that was thunder, wasn't it? On the natural day, I think it was thunder. And so it was the Christ. And so that's how God works in our lives. When you give him a lordship over your life, then Jesus becomes your example. And Christ on Jesus is the way God works on you and through you. And he says, who has what? But notice that helping verb. Just like we were talking about in that confession. It says, uh, now, Father, as you look down from your holy habitation from heaven to bless us, as you said in your word, we have talked about this. We what? Believe. Well, think about that. The word believe is the word lombano. Lombano means to take in any way you can. To take hold of it in any way you can. In other words, when you pray, what? When you uh, have faith in God, for whosoever shall what? Say to this mountain, quote me, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall what? Take in whatever manner he can, but shall what? Believe that he receive and that he shall take in whatever manner to whatever degree and by whatever means. But he believes. In other words, oh, he takes it. Now, whatever means he can, comprehend it, whatever, believes what? They use the word believe, but it means to take hold in any way you can, to any degree, and by any means. Believe what? You received it, or believe you what? Have it. Or in other words, or take hold of it by any means you can. Any, means, any way that, you can, that makes sense to you, you take it. Believe you receive it, and you shall what? Have it. Therefore, I say unto you what things of you desire when you pray what? Believe. In other words, take it, by whatever means, say whatever means, to whatever degree, say by whatever means, manner, or degree. By whatever means, manner, or degree. Take hold of it by whatever. See, Jesus said like this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. I am the way. Well, that's very emphatic. It's very dogmatic. It's... it's that's very dogmatic. So for him to be the way, just looking at that in John chapter, where is that? In John chapter, I am the way, the, John 14. Am I right? John 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I wrote in my notes, uh, that, is, that is not very democratic. So I don't, when I was raising my family, our children, we ain't give them no vote now. We weren't popular parents. As a matter of fact, somebody said to us when we had our first or second child, oh, because our first child was born when I was 30, in 1982, I was 34. And when, young, when people had children, they had children with 18. Well, I ain't, we didn't even start until I was 34. So when we go out with our children, they say to us, oh, these are your grandchildren. Yeah, the world is still the same. So it's not very dim So we, we don't, ain't no voting here. Well, would you like to vote on what you're gonna have for breakfast? Well, you gonna have for breakfast what we brought from the stove, and what we gonna cook. 
and you're going to learn to eat all of it. And when you get on your own and get your own, then you can start fixing your own. But here, this, so it's not very democratic. Number two, it's very dogmatic. Number three, he's emphatic. Number four, it's problematic. Number five, it's traumatic because it's fanatical. It's, it's, it's just to say, I am the way. And ain't no other way to the Father but by me. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Not, not that I am ways. I am truth, truths, and I am life of all kinds. No, I am the only one there is. Because it is the example that he sets for us to live as if the creator of the universe has put something on us. And when you think like that, and when it, it is that you, you, it, to you, you are different. You are, there's nobody else exactly like you. They haven't had the experiences you have had. They don't have the interaction you have. You're totally different from anybody else. So then he says in Mark, that I quoted Mark already, blessed be, profound respect for the idea that God is what? For us, to us, what? The father of our Lord Jesus, who is the example setter to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, the example setter, Christ, read, who what? Has blessed. Now that's a problem right there. That has. I'm trying to get somewhere, but I, I see I'm going to. Now write these, I, I told you all 23 helping verbs. There are 23 words that can throw you off. Now the first five are okay because they are linking verbs, they are subject, they are state of being verbs. You, you, I'm just telling you, they means equal. For example, if you say what? I am sick. Sick am I. If I, that means I is the same thing as what? Come on, talk to me. It's what? I is the same thing as what? Sick. So it's a sick I. And why is it a sick eye? It's described, the eye is described as being what? Sick. And am is the key thing. Am is the equal sign. Am says, whoever I is, I is what over there describes me as. I is not, I'm not described as sick. No, I am what is sick. That's what am means. It's an equal sign. I, so it's am, is, he is sick. Same thing. He is sick. Am is are. They are what? Sick. It's an equal sign. I am is are. I what? Was sick. Past tense. That's better. But it's something to think about. If you say I am sick, you are putting yourself there in the present tense. And you... you that's where your faith should be. And faith calls things which be not as though they what? Were. And am is are, was, and they were sick. Am is are, was, were, and they will be. Then we go to these helping verbs. So these what? Be, been, being. Let's say them together. Be, being, and being. Am is are, was, or be, been, being. What? Have, has, and had. Do does and did can and could shall and should will and would and may might and must you can get rid of the last 18 you can't hold on to the am is are was and were but be been being have as had do does did can could shall should will would may might must I taught this when I was in high school, junior high school. That was, I don't know how many years ago was that. But notice, blessed, prof, it is profound respect to, for us that God to us is the father of who we have given authority over us. And the authority that we have over us has a father, has a source, and the source is God himself. Who is Jesus, and Jesus is the example of showing how it works and because Christ was God in an out-of-body experience. Uh, 
God stepped out of himself and he looked at himself and says, uh, I got that tonight. Uh, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. I hadn't planned to look at that tonight. Let's go on. Now read. So now look at that has. Blessed, let's read. Blessed, profound, with res profound respect. Read. Blessed be what? The God. Read. And Father of our what? Lord Jesus Christ. Who get rid of get rid of the helping verbs? Who what? Blessed us. Notice the past tense in the word the D E D on the blessed us. Why would the writers add in the word has? Well, doesn't it mean the same thing? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who what? Who what? Simply straight out, flat out what? He what? He blessed us. Well, we don't know exactly when he blessed us. Has gives you a clue. That it, it began in the past and it is still going on right now. But I think if you look at it and say he what? He simply what? Blessed us. That still means I still got it. It didn't say he had blessed us. No, he blessed us. Therefore, I'm, say I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Mm, Lord Jesus, have mercy. Blessed means, blessed means empowered to prosper. And I have a profound respect for the fact that not only is God my father, but notice he says, he has, he, well, he, he, he what, just simply flat out what? Blessed us. What did he bless you with? Every. Everything, every what? Spiritual blessing. Spirit, empowered to prosper, profound, deeply profound, deep, profound respect. Spiritual blessings, where? In heavenly places. It's not in heavenly, but see, the devil's in place, walking who we may devour, seeking who we may devour. But he says, in where? In Christ. Look at the, another one here. Oh, I gotta get hurry up. Look at Second Peter one. Y'all know where I'm going. I see it every time. I got it right here in my Bible, but I'm trying to get to something. So we looked at this confession tonight. It says, "Who now, Father, as you look down from your heaven, holy heaven to from heaven, to bless us as you said in your word, we believe." In other words, we take hold in what a manner means and degree we take hold of whatever it is we we believe we receive those blessings we receive the blessings in other words we don't have to believe it, but to us believe means to i don't have it yet it's on the way out there it's way out there somewhere and i'm just gonna have to believe and that's what it says to us in the english language in the culture in western civilization it says i don't have it yet would you agree with that when you use the word believe, that means you don't have it yet, right? So then, but what did the scripture say? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who what? Blessed us. Say, I'm blessed. Look at it, look at, look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. 2 Peter 1, 1, read, Simon Peter, bond servant, apostle of Jesus Christ. Notice he always throw that in there. I'm, not, I'm specially sent. I'm, under, I'm a bond servant, bonded. I'm specially sent of Jesus Christ. This whole thing about Jesus, the man, anointed with Christ, who is God in the out-of-body experience, and so we can see God on him, but we can't see God, but we can see the effects of God. So people cannot see God, but they can certainly see and what looks to be like God on you. Would you agree? Hey, I know you're right. To those, read, to those who what? It does it is again. Another helping verb. Look at that. To those who what? No, no, no. Look at the helping verb. What? Who have. You don't need it. To those who what? Obtained. Do you have it? Who obtained what? This like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God. In other words, the righteousness of God or God's righteousness. How do we know that you have obtained this like precious faith? Because righteousness means is the characteristic, the qualities, and the resemblance of righteous. Righteous means to be full. It means to abound. It means to resemble the likeness of what is just right, real good, and always is the proper thing to say, do, and be. And so when you act, every, listen to me, everything you do, and when you act out, you are acting out of your righteousness. That is, your, your actions are the righteous acts. Your righteousness are the righteous acts. 
It's righteous works. It's translated righteous works. It's translated righteous acts. It's translated righteousness of God. So how is it that we are the righteousness of God? Because he has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing. Peter says he has what? Given us who, to those who have what? Obtained those who what? Obtained it. See, I like to go right to the jugular on this. Those who obtained what? Like precious faith. See, when did you obtain this like precious faith? If you have obtained it, yeah, we understand that means you got it. But when did you obtain it? It, 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 it goes back to Nicodemus. Nicodemus, you can't understand this kind of lifestyle until it is as if you have become born all over again. You must be born again. Well, how can I be born again? Can I go a second time and enter into my mother's womb and then be born all over? No, Nicodemus. I'm not talking about being born again like that. It is like you, your whole thought life, you, your outlook on life, your, your impressions, the way you see things, is totally different. It's like, oh, it's like, like I got born all over again. And then when you get born all over again, you get rid of all of the guilt all of the uh, rejection, the hurt, all the stuff that you carry, because you ain't been born again. Because if you've been born again, it's a process of, that you work through in your feelings and your emotions, but if you really understand what it means, you lay all that stuff aside. Because all of it puts you back, puts, sets you back. The, to those who what? Obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God, our Savior in Jesus Christ. Next verse. Verse 2 says what? Grace, read, grace and peace. Be what? Notice that heaven verb. Well, it could be in there. I got to look at the text. But grace and peace be what? Multiplied to you. In how, how is our grace? How is this favor? How is it that this, this grace means unmerited divine favor, unconditional love and acceptance, a favor done without the expectation of having to give do a favor in return? That's what it means. It's doria. Doria. A doron is a gift given without the expectation of a gift in return. It's called the gift. And so, the grace and peace be multiplied to you in what? The knowledge of God and what? Of Jesus Christ. Next, read. As his divine power, they say has given. We can just change that to what? His divine power, what? Gave us. Gave us what? Talk to me. I hope you understand where I'm coming from. We just be so, we're so busy pushing our blessing away from us. And it's right there in the Bible. And they use these helping verbs. This am is our was word. That's fine. Because you need those linking verbs to link this, to say this is that. Which you saw that the prophet Joel spoke about. Your sons and daughters will dream dreams. No, your old men will dream dreams. Your sons and daughters will have vision. This is that. So you can, this is that. You need the is. But you don't need to put yourself on the other side of sickness or disease or broke. I am broke. I am blind. I don't understand. No, 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 no. As his divine power, what? Gave us. How many? Gave us how many? Talk to me. Now, God is able to do. It is as if God is able to do. Exceedingly abundantly above all that above Abundant all that you what? Ask or think, but get this. It's according to what? It's according to the power. This working where? In you. So if the power is working in you, well what is, what listen listen to me. What then is the power that has to work in you? What is this power? Well, we say it's the power of God. Well, what is the power of God? Well then you gotta go back to God. It is it is when you take the knowledge that you have, the understanding. The knowledge, the love, the favor, the grace, courage, wisdom, comprehension, uh, uh, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, self-control, uh, discernment, uh, mercy, uh, all of the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, and everything else you can come up with. And you start using it. Your faith, your love, you use it. You use it. Perseverance. You got to hang in there.
You use it. And so God is able to do exceedingly abundant above all that you ask or think, but it's according to your desire and your willingness to use what you believe, what you believe, what you have, what he's already given you. What has he? What do you have that is as if God has given you? Well, the ability to have you ever gotten so mad that you want to tear somebody off, but you held your peace. Mm -hmm, that, that, that's a good one right there. It's called self control. Paul said, when I desire to do good, evil is what? Present. But I went on and did good anyway. Are you listening? So God has blessed us. Well, that says it all right. But God also what? Just simply flat out what? Blessed us. Well, has just put us in a time frame to say somewhere in the past he blessed us and it is still in effect because that's present perfect tense. It is still in the it is still in effect right now. That's just to let you know it started in the past and it is continuing. But so they say that it started in the past but as his divine power what? Blessed us. Blessed us with, uh, gave us what? All things that pertain to what? Life and God. So I say I have it all. I have all things. Say I have it Come on, you're not strong enough. See, I have all things that, to, that pertain to my life. I have all things that pertain to my life. Ah, no. I have all things that pertain to my life. And that is in my soul that I was talking about Sunday. Can you live in your soul? Your mind, your thought, your will, your intellect, your emotions, your secret. There are 23 of them. 24 members of your board of directors, your five senses, your secrets, all these discernment, all these things. You got to use them every day. You use all 24 every time you need one. That's how he works according to the power that is at work in you. You say, well, I, no, you got to be proactive on this one. He's, had, he gave us all things that pertain to life and God through what? The knowledge of what? Of him who called us by what? Virtue. By glory and virtue. That's another word. Now, look at another one. We covered Mark chapter 11, verse 12, uh, 22, 23, and 24, have faith in God. Now, look at this. Now, Father, as you look down from your holy habitation in heaven to bless us to, because of your profound respect and appreciation for us, to bless us, as you said in your word, we take hold by any means, in a manner, and to any degree possible. We take hold of it, and we now receive it. I could turn that around and say we receive it. No, you got to take hold to it in order to receive it. Because somebody can give you something, but you, if I give you something, and you don't reach out to what? Take it. You, it's not yours. You, you, you won't even reach your hands out there and so it drops on the ground. You got to take it. So when, when, you, when someone gives you something, you got to what? Reach out and take it. By any means, to any degree, and, and, and uh, in any way possible. And so here he says, we take hold by any means, to any degree. So manner means, I, I think I said like this, manner means and degree. I put, take it in the manner, the means, and the degree. Those blessings. You got to take those blessings. You got to take those blessings. Now, so then we might look at this to change that to give you a clue as to what we need to do with that confession after now 45 years now. 35 years, you might say. 35 years of making that confession. Just for a moment, uh, look at Ezekiel. Uh, Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Look at Ezekiel 33. We talked about the soul. Now, watch this. Unless you are alive in your soul. You know, the King James says, with patience, possess your soul. You got to hold on to your soul. 
Your soul consists of your mind, your will, your emotions. Your, I, I even listed them here. Your soul consists of these things. And, it's, and I had to, I, I'm not so I, I wrote them down so I wouldn't, uh, so I would remember them. Um, use your mind, your will. Here we go. Let's try to remember. Now get ready to write real quickly. Number one, your will. I, your determination, your will. I, this is what I want to do. It's my thing. I'm going to do what I want to do. Do you know all things are yours? So you, you will to, if you want something, you will to do it. You will to do it. So will is the chairman of the board. Number two, choice. You got to make some decisions. Well, God going to work it out. Try that. He going to work it out. Well, that means, see, well, that means I'm just going to pray. And I'm going to sit down. And I'm going to be passive. And everybody else is making, putting input, making input into this thing that I need to do. But I'm not putting any input into it myself. So therefore, everybody else is making what? Decisions for me. Because I, the choice that I made was I'm going to let God do it. In other words, let is a subjunctive mood. It means let it, Jesus, God, God says, let us make man. Let it be. Imagine it would be what it would be if it is if man would understand what it means to be made in the image and in the likeness of God. Let us make man. Imagine what it, your life would be like. What would be your attitude, your disposition, your, your energy level? What if you could just imagine that you were created in the image and likeness of God? Let us make man in our image according to our own likeness and let them have what? Dominion. The dominion means you got to use what you got. It ain't going to happen because you say, well, let the law, the law going to work it. I try that. Tomorrow when you go punch the clock, don't punch it. Just stay in your car and say, God going to work it out. Try that. Number three is your mind. You got to have a, your mind. You need to see the hero is with the Lord. Our God is one. And you should love the Lord with all of your what? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your soul. You can love God with your heart. That's your spirit of who you are. You love this image. You got to love this image. Evolution sold to us early on in life was a problem to us and made us think we we're first second class citizens. But here he says, let us make man in our image, and you shall love the Lord God with all of your heart. That's the image, the image that you have of yourself in your heart. You cannot get any further than what you have in your heart. Nor can you rise any level any higher than the thoughts that you have in your mind. Unless you think it for as a man so what? Thinks. And if you put the lid, like a, a lid on a jar, John Maxwell talked about the law of the lid and it's 26 irrefutable laws. And one of them is the law of the lid. And many of you put a lid on your own life. Well, I can't do that. That's the lid right there. No, uh, 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 that, uh, no, I, uh, uh, no, I can't do that. You have to hear you. You have to catch yourself putting lids and limitations on yourself. So, your mind. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. That's your heart and your soul. That's all of your thoughts and all these other things that hooked up in there. And love him with your mind. Use your mind. You can, you can remember a lot of things. You ain't got to go crazy, think you're crazy, think you can't remember. Use your mind. You got to love him with your mind. What would your life, thought life be, your comprehension and understanding would be? What it would be like if you love God with your mind? You would want to study. You want to read. You want to know. You want to comprehend. You want to achieve what you conceive you can have. It would be as if you love God with all of your mind. No, that's too much work. Love with your heart. That's that image. And your soul, that's everything that else, all your, your choices and everything else. And with all your mind. And then it said, love with your what? Your strength. Well, you got to be strong in you know, all this thing. Your strength. 
the strength of your determination, character, the strength of your physical, not just your physical body. You got to have a strong mind. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his what? Might. Be strong in the image that you have about God and you. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So is your mind. You got to love with your mind. The old thing, or the uh, historical black colleges says that a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Number four, your thoughts. If your thoughts condemn you, God is greater than your thoughts. You're going to think some things and put yourself down. I don't, I don't know when the last time I put myself down. Please, my goodness, don't think like that. But if you think like that, you're putting a lid on yourself. And nobody can put the lid on, and nobody can put the lid on you, and nobody can take the lid off of you. They can come and offer you a lid for you to take it or leave it. Many of us go get them ourselves and put them on ourselves. Number five, purpose. What's your purpose? What are you supposed to be doing? Well, I'm supposed to take care of my family. I'm supposed to take care of myself. And then here's another purpose. My purpose has really come unfolding. You want to prosper. You want to make some money. You want to have some money. You don't want to be broke. Your words, I, I, this, I'll never be broke another day in my life. Well, then what's the purpose for the money you're going to have? Well, why have the money? To get some more things. Life does not consist in the abundance of so many things. So you can get a whole lot of things. But then what's good is the things? And then you got to serve those things. Well, I'm going to get me a vacuum cleaner. It's going to help me to vacuum clean the house. You're going to serve that vacuum cleaner. Because it ain't going to vacuum that house by itself. You're going to have to push it. So you're going to serve the vacuum cleaner. I'm going to get me a car. The car going to serve me. Yeah. You're going to have to service it. Pay for the service. Keep it up. Keep it clean. You're going to, you're going to be a servant. Your purpose. So the purpose of wealth. Here's the purpose of wealth to make a change and a difference in the world. The purpose of your wealth is God wants to want you to be rich. He wants you to be rich. He gives us richly all things to enjoy. And when your enjoyment is full, then turn around and make a difference in the world with your money. Give to the kingdom of God to change somebody else's life for the better. And do you know what? And God will prosper you. We learned this a roundabout way. The first time we gave a thousand dollar offering was when Edith Holtz, Bishop Edith Holtz was here. And then the next one, Bishop Carlita Vaughn came. Right, we ain't used to that. A thousand dollars? I ain't no thousand dollars. And we went a little further. Then I saw, went to Fick with them, Dr. Price and them. I saw them people get five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars, hundred thousand dollars, hundred fifty thousand dollars. I said, well, how are you doing this? Why would they give away all that money? And one day, we sold a $5,000 offering. We needed a musician at that time. And we sold, then Dr. Hitt came back and said, you went and uh, uh, gave once and again to my necessity. He said, We're gonna, we want to raise $1.5 million and we want to get, Karen and I gave another $5,000. And so, to, in, uh, to Dr. Price, Dr. Price personally, and that Sunday, we got back from fit with him that Saturday, and that Sunday, a man and his son was sitting right there. And they became a musician with the church by seven years. Now, I can't buy no miracle. But I used my money to show, show God that I could use one. Then, okay, y'all know the rest of the story. So your purpose for money. Number six, your reason. What do you think? Your re I'm giving you give this list now. Your reason, right? Now, reason. You can't reason. That's what I was going to deal with tonight. Reasoning. Because we talked about this message of being the righteousness of God. And reason is the power of your mind to think, to understand, and form judgments by the process of logic. Just plain old logic. It's the law of, it's the, law of the non-contradiction of your mind. You have to force yourself to be stupid. You have to tell yourself something crazy because your mind is logical. Your mind, is, it knows when things that don't make no sense. In order for you to get thrown off, you got to deceive your own self. It's called reason. Then intellect. 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 
Number eight, your secrets. Your secrets, my goodness. Paul, uh, Paul uh, I think it's David said uh, something, else. not cleanse, that's presumptuous sayings, but secrets. This is the secrets of our hearts. And see, we have a lot of secrets that don't know about to know about, and that's really controlling our lives. Somebody died early in our lives. Somebody offended us a long time ago. You hold on to these secrets. You believe you're going to die. You believe you're going to have cancer. You're going to believe you're going to, something's going to happen. You got a whole lot of secrets. And them secrets, they put your butt because nobody knows it. Nobody knows you're being tormented. And it's the spirit of fear. Whatever it is, and it's, you got to get rid of your secrets. That's why you need to get up. Start tell, testifying and talking and tell it. If you tell it, you'll get over it. But if you hold it, it'll kill you. I know a lot of people, they hold on to stuff because they won't talk about it. Secrets. Number nine, imagination. You got an image. Let us make man a corner. Image. It's an image. Whatever you can image. Put on a canvas of your imagination. If you can see it, write this vision. Do it, Terry. Wait for it. It is for an appointed time. For the vision shall tarry, shall come to pass. It shall not lie. You have to imagine this thing. I imagine myself. I, I tell you, I got. I, I imagine that I'm looking at giving this ministry a hundred thousand dollars a year. We've done it already. When we sold our property to the ministry, the ministry benefits from that now. A year. Number two, you, so you gotta have an, you gotta see yourself well. I ain't seeing myself no no way but well. How about y'all? You can't. You got to see. You got to see it. I you ain't gonna see yourself in no wheelchair. See yourself with your legs cut off. See you can't. That ain't for me. See yourself not even recognizing your daughter, your children, your husband, your family. You crazy? It's a secret. It could be a secret that I'm going crazy, a secret that somebody lost their mind in my family. Somebody said something to you, some put some roots on you, some kind of th some, some old foolish talk. Your imagination, then your understanding. Number 10 is understanding. The ability to grab things with your mind. We think, the, we think of grabbing things with our hands, but I need to grab things with my mind. When I hear something, I'm going to get that. You got to grab things with your mind. It's called understanding. And the devil comes for the word. Because when he comes and you don't understand it, you can't tell nobody else about it. To show you you don't understand it, you can't tell nobody about it. If you can tell somebody about what you know and it's clear and you make it clear to them, that's the only way you know you really understand it. You say, oh, I, got, I understand it. Well, what do you think I just said? And then they'll tell you. They say, no, that ain't what I mean. I hope you understand that now. Number 11 is perception. How you perceive this thing? You perceive certain things. You comprehend certain things. I perceive, you can look, it's called the handwriting on the wall. People be talking to you and saying some stuff. You say, now, what I, what I really hear you saying is this. You can perceive things. Number 12 is meditation. You got to get yourself quiet, turn off the TV, turn off the radio. Oh, five or ten minutes. When you got something pressing on your thought in your mind, just shut up and be quiet. Sit down. Lay your head on the pillow and just think about it. Two times a day, you go into what we call twilight theta. One is when you're coming out of a dead sleep delta. When you're so sleepy, somebody can do this to your eyelid and you don't even know it. And then when you come just before you coming out of your dead sleep delta, your dead sleep, you come into a twilight. In this twilight period, this between active, uh, active uh, theta, when you come out, coming out, you don't know whether you are here or there. You don't know where you're at. But you're in the world. You're not of the world. You are caught up somewhere. You can hear things. You dream things. You get music. You get uh, revelation. You get understanding. You get insight. You do it twice a day. You do it when you're waking up and just before you get up and open your eyes and when you get ready to fall off to sleep in the evening at night, you go back through this twilight theta where you're in both dimensions in the spirit and in the body. And that is where you have revelation. 
It's called meditation. And, and sometimes you have to get up and go write it down. You better get it right down real quick. Or keep a little recorder by your bed or a pencil and a notepad. Because you say, oh, I'm going to say it six times and I'll remember when I wake up. The devil will steal it. Number 13, integration. Integration means you take something and mix it in with what you have. And so that's what happened with integration with us. In, in, we get the word integrity. It mixes in with something else. What happens with Christians is that we don't heard so much mess from the, with these religious Pharisees and, and, and leaders until we just take this new word, this new wine, and mix it with the old wine, and we lose it all. And so you have to integrate this in and find ways to bring out some new and to bring out with some old. Because otherwise, you bring it all new, you're going to lose the old. If you bring it all old, you're going to lose the new. And that's number, th number 13. Number 14, your emotions. Your emotions. How you feel? Well, I just feel. You can hear people. I feel. That's true. You can feel. Feel bad. Feel good. That's how you feel. That's in your body and your five senses. And your body is 99% of your five senses. Your sight, smell, taste, touch, or the other ones. That's about 1%. So you're feeling. So feeling is a dominating emotion. And you, you uh, no, number 15, your desires. This is what you want. This is what I desire. What do you want? The world, the universe is waiting for you to tell it what you want. Tell God what you want. Tell the world what you want. When you want something, you have to go and, and say, now, Think about, get clear the schedule, clear the paper, get, talk about it first, get it all clear in your mind first before you pray about it. Don't be so quick to pray, I'm going to pray. You ain't got your mind together yet. Your desires. Number 16, your intent. What you going to, what's your intention for what you're getting ready to pray for? Number 17, what do you believe? Do you believe you can do this? Do you believe, you, it, 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 do you believe that new beginnings are, are not for just, what is it? New beginnings are not for just the young, and not for whoever it is. New beginnings are not just for the young. New beginnings for everybody. And then number eighteen, abundance. We have been so poverty minded. We have been so poverty minded. We haven't thought of abundance. But you know what I used to think when I was growing up? There, there was not enough money in the world for everybody. So God had to take some from somebody else to give it to me. Do you know there is no shortage of money nowhere? Ain't no shortage. Say there's no shortage. Even them drug dealers down there in, in, in certain places, you know why they're down there? There's money down there. <laughs> so we have to think of abundance. That God doesn't have to curse you in order to bless me. No, if we put our faith together, and you use your faith, I use my faith, you can get what you want, I get what I want. And it, it, he is an equal opportunity blesser. Abundance. And nobody can keep you back if you are willing to take the lid off your own life. Number 19, your decisions. These are things that make up your soul. They make up your soul. You got to have some, the willingness to make a decision. The world is waiting for you to make decisions. Well, I, I'm going to let God, I'm going to ask God to take care of it. Well, that's your decision then. That means I ain't going to do that. What is your decision? That's why you need to win. Num then you find senses of what? Sight, smell, taste, touch, and feel. These, my friend, are the 24 members of your personal board of directors of your soul. They make up your soul. And you must train to accept and agree to a vision provided by the very spirit of who you are. Who you are. So you, in, your, if the, in your image, you can say, what? I'll never be sick a day in my life. Say that with me. I'll never be sick a day in my life. So come on, say, I, say, say, I'll always have more money than I can spend. The problem with this, you say this around people, and then guess what? But the good part of it, he, you say what? He has given us, or he what? Gave us all things. He's blessed us. He blessed us. He gave us all things. Now you're using it, and you talk this way around people, and they call you arrogant, and so you, the, the, but that's not what it is. It's confidence. The word is parousia. We get the word on par. When you play golf, it's on par. On par. Is what, it takes you three strokes to get this ball. If you get it in three strokes, it's on par. But if you miss it, you're under par or you're over par. If you only use two to get it, in, then it's under par. If you take 
four strokes to get it out of the three allowed it, then you're over par. So par is parasia. Parasia is par and racia is to speak. It means all of the freedom to speak. Get this. Because of the absence of fear. You can take that scripture down now. Because of the absence of fear. All freedom of speech because of the absence of fear. And so this is the confidence. People around you won't understand you. Hey, that's all right. You can get over it. But they'll think. You will think. And they'll persecute you. They'll call you high-minded. They'll call you, I want it more out of life. I want it more. And when I was in the Methodist church, I had some people tell me, well, Walt, Mickey, they call me Mickey. And the bishop put me in Sanford, sent me to Sanford. They don't tell you, they don't call you two or three days during the conference and say, we plan on sending you to Sanford. Would you be willing to go? They wait until three o'clock service during the convention on the floor and spring it on you by surprise. And you don't know it until you hear it. That you're going 75 miles one way to go to church. I say, how can I have a ministry of music and counseling and all had all these dreams and wonderful things that we did here? How can I have all that 75 miles one way just to get that one way to get there? I just married. I said, I got to go 75 miles just to go to church? And I'm teaching every day, Monday to Friday in Bartow? I got to come back to the lady and then drive 75 miles on the other side of Orlando? I turned in my resignation. The preacher said, well, why did you do that? I said, and I went back to my home church and sat down. They didn't know what to do with me then because I resigned the appointment that the bishop gave me. I wasn't disobeying the bishop. I just resigned. I wanted to go back in, into the ministry. I wanted to go back into what I was doing. You don't necessarily want to be a pastor. All you want to do is live this life that you heard about, that you've heard people singing about it, you've heard people talking about it, and the way they talk about it, say it's a good life. Well, then that's what I wanted. I wanted this life. And so some people think, well, you got to be a preacher in order to get it. No! <laughs> you can have it if you want it. You can be anything in life you want. And so I ended up being a preacher, not because I wanted to. I'm looking for no preacher. I hope you all don't think preaching is the big thing. It's about responsibility. About growing, making sure you grow. If nobody else grows, you got to grow. If anybody's going to take the lid off of that life, it better be you. You got to be an example to the believer. And it's, it's a responsibility. And if you save yourself, here's the key. For if you save yourself, and really save yourself, then you will save those who are willing to hear you. And that's the only people you can save. Those who are willing to hear you. Confess me, I'm blessed. God gave me all things that pertain to life and godliness. And I use it every day. And from this day on, I will use it. I will seek opportunities to use everything God gave me. And I will, leave, I will not leave it up to him to use what he gave me. I will use it and ask him to show me more and more how to really put it together and to make it work because it will be his power. He is able to do exceeding abundantly above all according to his what? Power that you are willing to let and put to work through you. He will do it. He will show you great and mighty things and you will achieve more than you can imagine. Amen? Hope you got some out of this. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Please stand to your feet. Rejoice for the steps. Well, I thought so. <laughs> Please stand your feet. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice for the steps. Rejoice. 
your eyes for the steps of a righteous man. They are. You can at least sing, right? Take the lead out. Rejoice. Rejoice for the steps. Order. Oh, These 24 steps that of God rejoice for the steps. Time. In the time of trouble, God will uphold. It means if God is, He'll preserve you. God will lift him up, so rejoice your steps up. Hey, 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 listen, listen now. We talked about 24 steps tonight. You can use these things and put them together. These are steps you use in life. So he's not saying, the song, the steps are not physical steps. But the way you get from one point to the next point with success, accomplishments, and things that you want to achieve. There are certain steps. And it is as if God orders your steps when you start operating this way. Because when a man's what? Ways. Please, Lord, he'll make what? Even your enemies of confusion and doubt and unbelief. Amen. Lift him up, so rejoice your steps are ordered of God. Rejoice. Rejoice. Thank you for coming. God bless you. And you are dismissed. They are ordered of God. Rejoice for the steps. Look at here. Bridget, Marvel.